right. So, uh, who are you and uh, what's your relation to Bitcoin? Okay, so my name is Olaf Carlson Lee. I work for Coinbase. Uh, I was Coinbase's first employee um, a little over a year ago. I got involved in Bitcoin about three years ago, uh, around this time. All right, so <laughs> that's pretty much the same time as when I when I uh, got into Bitcoin. Um, what do you think about the conference so far? I think it's pretty fantastic compared to last year's. Uh, you can tell that money has entered the space, right? So last year our booth was a small plastic sign that said Coinbase. We had an iPad uh, with the website and some t-shirts. So I think a lot of other booths were that way too. Put together at the last second, not a lot of funding available. This conference you can tell that venture capital has supported a lot of these endeavors. And you can tell that in the venue of the space, you can tell that with the booths, you can tell that with the general legitimacy of all the companies involved. So I'm, I'm pretty impressed, frankly. Okay, um, I'm curious that because you, you said that you got into Bitcoin uh, three years ago. Uh, do, do you have any kind of, uh, like, uh, do you like Bitcoin uh, from, from any kind of ideological uh, perspective? Absolutely. So I first heard about Bitcoin three years ago. I became immediately very, very obsessed and read everything I could. Uh, I was going into my senior year of college and I decided to write my undergraduate thesis on Bitcoin. So for about a year there, I was researching Bitcoin and writing about it obsessively. Uh, this was around the time the price was dropping from 30 down to $2, and everyone kind of thought this was just a dud experiment. I was still really intrigued by it, even if that was true. I knew some sort of cryptocurrency was going to change the world, whether it was Bitcoin or a future iteration. So I just kept, kept at my research and kept reading about it. Then I... Um, I basically decided, you know, I, I don't want to take an academic interest in this. I actually want to delve in and make this happen. So I, you know, searched the space for good companies, and I think Coinbase had the same vision as I did, uh, which was very, very, very long term. Um, also, you know, recognizing that this isn't this isn't a short term win. This is actually a long term win as far as um, payments. So for me, any anything that costs money to move money is just a net loss for all of society. If I'm trying to exchange with you, A to B, anything that prohibits us from exchanging that wealth transfer is just a net loss. It's just an inefficiency for everyone. So being able to reduce that to zero for everyone in the entire world, I think, has huge macroeconomic effects. If you can imagine just 3% back into the entire economy, basically. On top of that, I think that the traditional banking sector, uh, you know, I, I entered college at, in the wake of the... American and kind of worldwide financial crisis in 2008. And I think a lot of people were somewhat disillusioned with uh, the way banking works in general, right? So, you know, investment banks, you know, use user deposits in order to kind of fund high risk investments. And, you know, when they fail at that, they're not treated fairly like a normal business. Uh, they're actually just bailed out by the government. So I, I think that a lot of people saw that and recognized that our whole monetary system is like pseudo private. Um, the Federal Reserve is a private entity. Um, the International Monetary Fund, you know, definitely has ties to government and everything. So I, I think that monetary policy, um, as, as it said, is you know can can you know be be led by people who have kind of interests, right? Not necessarily the interests of um, the people in general. So Bitcoin purely democratic, right? So the network chooses 51%. That means it's. Um, the majority and that means that's what the protocol is so to me it's just fascinating on that level that the people actually decide what the currency is going to look like and the people actually decide how to move the money and what the rules of that money are and so yeah I, I, I really do like it for ideological reasons I find the technology fascinating I find the business aspect fascinating and it's amazing to you know scale a company while you're taking on some of the largest players in the world right payment processors and banks and, you know, that's that's basically a list of the Fortune 500 companies in a way. So, yeah, it's it's exciting, and I I'm really really into it. <laughs> All right, I, I feel very much the same way in, in a, lot, a lot of what you said. Uh, interesting. 
Uh, <clears throat> one aspect of that I want to ask just because I'm really curious, like, what do you think of, of Bitcoin, like, uh, as a currency, like, the features that yep. they, they put into yep. currency, what do you think of that? Yeah, so something I'm really fascinated by is microtransactions and tipping. So, you know, with without Bitcoin, whenever you were going to do a transaction that was between two geographically disparate locations, so over the internet or over, uh, you know, wire or through the mail, there was always kind of a minimum threshold for the amount you could do. Um, you can't really purchase anything for less than 99 cents online. Uh, and even then, 30 cents of that is going as a transaction fee to the payment processor. On top of that, you know, it, it, it inhibits international commerce, it inhibits um, remittances, right? So people want to work in one country but send money to another country to support their family, say. I think that all of our current payment infrastructure isn't very nice to that stuff. Um, you know, lot, very, very high fees, very slow transfers, currency conversion rates aren't always optimal, right? So I see a kind of decentralized tipping or decentralized microtransaction ecosystem growing very quickly surrounding Bitcoin. So I find it fascinating that I can send 15 cents from here in Amsterdam to China or India or America um, for free, and it can be 15 cents or it can be a million dollars, and it's, it's the same, right? So for me, I, I see it opening up a whole world of kind of, you know, in-game commerce, for example, like I'm playing a video game and I want to buy a new sword, right? But I only want to pay five cents, so I just tap the screen. It, it's, it's all in the background. It's all done. So in that way, you can visualize payments being made invisible, right? So these kind of microtransactions to use the internet could fuel a whole new system of uh, monetization. So I hate ads on the internet. I think everyone does. I've never clicked one. I've never purchased a product. It's just a waste of my time. Um, I would much rather pay five cents for a service than have ads on that service. So you can imagine a world in which using a website, um, small payments on the Bitcoin network are built into sort of the HTTP pro protocol, for example. Um, and in that way, you could pay very, very small fees for every time you use the internet, every time you send an email. This would prevent spam, it would eliminate the need for advertising, and potentially open up whole new areas of the economy that we can't really imagine right now. Uh, you can sit around trying to think of the Twitters and Facebooks that will be the killer apps of the blockchain all day. Mm -hmm. I know in my gut they're there. It's, it's hard to see what they will be, but I, I think we've got a lot of work to, go, to do, and we will get there eventually. Yeah. Uh, um, how do how do you see like the yeah, uh, any comment on like like what's the what's the roadmap or like the to to, to get a Bitcoin more mainstream? Like, uh, yeah, great question. So for me, it's um, it's a network effect. So much like you can imagine Facebook, uh, it makes sense for all your friends and you to be on the same social network. If I'm on a different social network than you are, um, we can't connect as well. So with, with money, there's this network effect is even stronger. You all want to be on that same currency, right? So Bitcoin is facing this chicken egg problem right now where uh, consumers are buying it and merchants are accepting it. But it's, it's still very, very uh, niche, right? Not widespread. And with these merchants you know, that we might talk to, a lot of time they say, you know, why would I accept this if no one has Bitcoin or no one spends Bitcoin? And with people that want to buy Bitcoin, they say, why, why would I buy Bitcoin if I can't spend it at any merchants, right? So this is kind of one of these back and forth problems. I see the, a great analogy being the internet, the early internet. So you look at 1994. Why would I host a website? Why would I, you know, pay for server space, hire a software engineer to build my website if no one uses the internet, okay? At, on the flip side of that, why, why would I pay 50 bucks a month and buy a computer, home computer, connect to the internet on this crappy broadband or whatever in order to visit all these websites that I have no need for and no one has a website, right? So it's this very same chicken egg effect where in order to build the network, you need to build both sides simultaneously and both sides don't want to join until the other side has been built up. So long story short, I think what we need to do is you, you need to target the supply side and the demand side. That is, you need to target the merchants and you know, payment acceptors of Bitcoin, and you need to target the users and payment buyers of Bitcoin. Uh, 
Um, so what, what this means really is creating killer apps for people to want Bitcoin. So for example, remittances, I think is going to be a huge killer app in the near future. I think micropayments is another killer app. Um, high risk markets because the irreversible nature, another kind of killer app for Bitcoin. So I, I see those being like the first early adopters in the next year or so. Uh, from there, you know, those users of those services are going to have a very strong incentive to purchase and use Bitcoin. Um, and so, so you see these kind of niche markets being filled where it makes sense on this network effect, even though it's still very early in the game. Um, and, and over time, the use case will become more and more and more compelling as more and more of the network joins, right? So once you get 51% of people using Bitcoin, all of a sudden, like the, la the latter 49% are just gonna pile on. So we're really in, that, in the hardest part of this, of this growth curve right now, where growing these very early niche markets and then from there kind of showing the advantages to people who um, you know it's slightly less advantageous to or slightly less or there are more and more obscure reasons why someone might use it but over time I think that uh, people will see the benefits it will help someone in some way there's going to be some app they want it you know some use case for them for Bitcoin and just over time it will build and grow steadily and slowly I don't see it being a one-year thing like a lot of people do I see it being a 10-year 20-year thing but throughout that time, I, I do see the end game being huger than most people realize. So I think it's overhyped in the short term and kind of underhyped in the long term. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, eventually we are going to see these internet uh, kind of protocol type currencies, whether it's Bitcoin or another cryptocurrency, really being the core financial money trans transmission method of the world. Oh, that was uh, very interesting. I I have to say, I, I agree, and uh, we do the same in Finland. Like we, we target both, both like the consumer side and the business side, uh, because because you really need to target both at the same time because yep. you have a huge chicken and egg problem, like you said. Yep. Um, and uh, I, I kind of I, I feel feel the same way about the potential because uh, the the fact that Bitcoin is uh, it's it's kind of non-political. You don't have the borders. Or the restrictions that you have with, with national currencies, yep. because uh, even the big ones like the U.S. dollar and the euro, even they have like uh, restrictions because they are limited to a certain kind of political regime or, or area and everything. But with Bitcoin, you have the potential that can actually be uh, the, the, really the first uh, digital uh, uh, universe of uh, currency. So that, that's kind of huge. Uh, yep. Okay, so uh, you already obviously. Talk, talked a lot about um, a lot about uh, what you feel about Bitcoin, but uh, I want to answer this question because uh, uh, I'll ask the question is uh, what what does Bitcoin mean to you? Uh, For me personally, like in my life, yes. I guess. Yes. For me, it's um, it's it's really kind of a passion just to see it grow, right? So every single time I can explain to someone what Bitcoin is and I see their eyes kind of light up, um, I remember that feeling where I, I recognized this is the most important technological development of my lifetime, without a doubt. This is you know, potentially the most important application of the internet. You know, Right now, the internet is primarily used for information transfer. If you can transfer scarcity and value the same way you can transfer packets of information, it's you know it's possible that we'll look back and say, you know, the Bitcoin protocol is as important as the TCP/IP protocol, or the Bitcoin protocol is as important as the SMTP email protocol, right? So, for me, it's just I feel like I see the future, and it's just seeing it happen, um, and and the way the various iterations of the, the companies entering the space and who gets into Bitcoin and who would you maybe expect to and not expect to like it? And, um, yeah, for me, it's it's just fascinating to watch it grow. I mean, I like I said, I really do like every part of it. I like the technological aspects. I you know I've learned so much about cryptography um, and kind of studied a lot, studied up a lot on economics and economic monetary theory because of Bitcoin. So it's been a gateway to a lot of different types of knowledge for me. All right. I think uh, we've covered uh, most of what I want to ask. Okay, cool. it, was, it was a pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Nice talking to you. Yeah. yeah.